Hashem Hashem Naseh V'Natsliach, Shiru Torah, Bukhim Abayim. We are uh, back here in our uh, lecture series, Stumped the Rabbi. Haven't seen you guys in some time, Baruch Hashem, asking questions. So, Bezot Hashem, after uh, a little bit of Devar Torah, the Parashat Noach, uh, we'll uh, give a few little insights, little thoughts that I had, Bezot Hashem. And then, Bezot Hashem, you guys will ask some questions, and HaKadosh Baruch Hu will give us the answers, Bezot Hashem. Uh, so, a uh, few things, updates, uh, like I said, we have a lot of things going on in regards to uh, the Kolel is actually uh, growing, Baruch Hashem. Uh, the, uh, we have a couple of uh, things uh, that are going to be uh, coming to market very soon. Um, the, uh, the flyer thing for anybody that's asking about it, uh, uh, that website should be up uh, within the next few days for people to order. Same thing with the books. Uh, and also, I just got word that Bo Hashem, our, uh, my first book, my first book in, uh, in Hebrew is uh, done, it's printed, it's uh, published, Bo Hashem. We're going to be giving out uh, a few thousand copies in uh, Eretz Israel. Anybody that is in, located in Eretz Israel and wants to uh, give some copies of the book in Eretz Israel, um, uh, please uh, contact me. Uh, and then we're uh, probably in about a month or so, we'll have uh, them available in, uh, in the U.S. Available in the U.S. for anybody that wants to give them out. Uh, the price is a fortune, uh, Baruch Hashem, but uh, <laughs> you don't have to pay for it uh, if you're going to be giving them out. And that's in essence the uh, policy is going to be with the book and these uh, new posters that... Uh, of course, everybody that has a brain understands that these things cost a lot of money. And uh, trust me when I tell you, it costs a lot of money. And uh, But uh, we got to get the material out there with everything that's going on in the world today. Uh, I saw some uh, some things recently, in, uh, what's happening in the world, what's happening in the... Uh, uh, what's just one tragedy after another. We need to get as much truth out there as possible so we can't let money be the... Uh, Continue being the Yetzirah that uh, slows down Kiruv. So we'll give them out for free. Uh, but as long as you're going to be giving them out right away to people and not uh, just uh, randomly dropping off, you know, everything you have at some shul and hoping for the best. Actually handing the people uh, the books in hand in hand. Uh, and, um, you know, we're, we're tired of wasting, you know, where you send somebody a bunch of stuff. And they just give that box to somebody else and they think that they've fulfilled the mitzvah. We, we don't want that. Uh, so as other shem, the books will come out uh, in Eretz Yisrael in the uh, next uh, it's couple of days. Uh, so again, anyone that wants to give them out, uh, please let us know. We'll send you a few. Um, probably be an average uh, between, I would say about you know, uh, 50 copies per person. Uh, and uh, of course, anyone that wants to share in uh, this mitzvah of, uh, of, of Kiruv and helping us publish uh, my first book is more than welcome uh, to donate on our website, bezeltashem.org, uh, to, uh, to help us uh, you know, with all of this huge cost, Baruch Hashem. Um, as far as the, uh, uh, you know, for those of you that are asking uh, two questions, one, um, you know, why aren't you... Uh, uh, with a uh, publishing house, meaning why self-publish, why uh, not, uh, I don't know, go to one of the organizations out there and publish it there. Uh, the answer is uh, relatively simple. Number one, if we uh, you know publish it with somebody, then we'd have to sell every copy because uh, nobody wants to publish your book if you're going to be giving out thousands of copies for free. Uh, it doesn't make any sense for them. Uh, so, uh, since we're more concerned about Kiruv than we are about making money, uh, then uh, that already kills the whole idea of uh, publishing it with somebody. Uh, but even if we would find somebody that uh, wouldn't mind us giving some copies for free, uh, the, the reality is, is that when you're dealing with publishings, uh, there are certain limitations, there are certain uh, things that uh, would cause delays. Uh, would cause delays uh, to getting the uh, the information out there, and uh, after having the the book uh, read, reviewed, and uh, publicly supported 
uh, by some of G'dolei Ador. Uh, they have uh, their letters in the book, uh, whether it's uh, the Rishon Lezion, Rav Yitzchak Yosef, Rav uh, Yosef uh, Mizrahi uh, from the U.S., Rav Yosef Chaim Mizrahi from Yerushalayim, Rav Gidon Ben Moshe, Rav uh, 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 Zamir, uh, and, and, and several other Chachamim uh, that uh, you know read the book word for word and uh, put their name on the line for it. Baal Hashem, we don't really need anybody else to uh, to tell us that it's uh, that it's good. And of course, again, people that read it, we'll see, we'll see what it is. Uh, so uh, again, uh, you know, from what I know, from uh, you know, I, I don't uh, I don't watch my own lectures. I don't uh, you know. Uh, um, I guess rate myself if you will I'm very critical of myself but uh, from what other people are telling me meaning uh, you know Rav Efraim the other rabbis that have read it um, they're saying it's a big deal they're saying the book is a very very big deal and uh, Bezot Hashem is going to be a very big hit to help a lot of people do Tshuva Baruch Hashem so Bezot Hashem from their uh, from their mouth to uh, Kadosh Baruch Hu's ears uh, so again, anyone that wants to be part of that is more than welcome to. Um, we're starting with, uh, I believe, uh, we'll be giving out like maybe like 5,000 copies uh, to get started. Everybody can simply do the math in their head. Uh, what they, uh, and especially once you see the book, it came out beautiful. Uh, very nice cover and, uh, and colors and so on. Uh, so, with that being said, let's get uh, going with uh, this week's parasha to, uh, to see what, uh, what we can find in the treasure chest, the never-ending treasure chest of the Torah Kedusha. Ele toldot Noach, Noach ish tzadik tamim aya bedorotav. We see that the parasha starts with, in a very unique way. Uh, every parasha is beautiful. We had obviously Bereshit Bara Elokim et Hashemayim ve'et Ha'aretz. HaKadosh Baruch Hu began the world. And last week's uh, uh, parasha where the Ramban says Bereshit also means Bechokma uh, with wisdom where at that time uh, he created time uh, and thereby if you look at the commentary by Rashi when people are asking questions about what came first, the chicken or the egg or uh, you know what uh, how did he do this and how did he do that uh, you simply you know have to just look at commentary by Rashi to answer uh, the overwhelming majority of your questions you see that in the beginning of uh, last week's parasha Rashi discusses how the creation itself took an instant uh, Hashem created everything in an instant and then over the next six days he put everything in its right place uh, whether it was the heaven or the earth or it was the animals or it was everything else, he simply uh, uh, put everything in place after that. And uh, where do we learn that from? Well, we see that uh, in the beginning of last week's parashat, parashat Bereshit, it says Bereshit. Bereshit bara elokim et hashamayim v'taz. Bara. Bara means to create from nothing. And only a Baruch Hu can create from nothing. We cannot create from nothing. We can do what's called yetzira. Uh, we, uh, you know, take something that already exists and innovate. And uh, in essence, that's what it says for the rest of the parasha. That uh, where you see uh, day one, day two, day three, uh, it uh, Kadosh Baruch Hu keeps mentioning the word uh, yetzel. That uh, he, uh, it's not that he created from nothing, but uh, rather he took what was already there. He took what was already there and uh and uh, innovated from it uh, uh and, and put it in uh, specific ways that he wanted it to be so the creation from nothing happened uh initially that's the word bara uh but then after that vayetzel that uh, hashem uh, created it's a different type of creation which is taking something uh, uh creating from something that already exists uh, same thing with the word vayas, vayas Elohim et uh, that he, uh, he took the, uh, uh, he made the firmament, meaning he uh, shaped it and, and put it in a certain place uh, that he wanted it. Uh, and uh, we, uh, we see that the rest of the words that uh, are used in each and every single day, it's uh, if somebody that knows the, the, the uh, 
you know, the Hebrew language knows that these are uh, Hashem telling us that he took something that already exists and, you know, uh, shaped it into what he wants it to be. Whereas uh, bara Elohim, bara means that he created from nothing. Now we uh, go and we obviously we heard the whole story with Adam and Chava. We, uh, uh, in, in last week's parasha, we uh, had a write-up where um, we uh, discussed how the, uh, really the biggest mistake in, uh, in history that uh, was ever made uh, as far as the creation is uh, concerned in the beginning was the fact that Chava simply allowed the Nachash to talk. That was, in essence, the biggest mistake in creation because at the end of it all, the, uh, the Nachash obviously knew what Hashem wanted. The serpent knew what Hashem wanted, knew what Hashem said, and, uh, but he wanted to uh, debate. He wanted a dialogue. So what did he do? He said to Chava, Chava, why, uh, you know, why aren't you eating from uh, these uh, fruits? Uh, is it because, uh, you know, Hashem said, don't eat from any of the trees? That's only because he's afraid that you're going to eat from the uh, tree of life and be like him. You'll be like God. Now, Chava immediately wanted to defend the truth. Wanted to defend the truth. And, no, 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 snake. He didn't say don't eat from all of the trees. He just said, don't eat and don't touch the tree of knowledge. So here we see there's two mistakes being made. Number one, she added something. Hashem only said, don't eat from the tree of knowledge. He didn't say, don't touch. And number two, she responded to him. She debated with him. Why? Because there are certain types of people that you're supposed to debate. There are certain types of people that you're supposed to run away from. And the Gemara says that uh, when it talks about learning how to, learning enough to what to know how to deal with an apikos with a heretic that's only if that heretic is a non-jew but if that heretic is a jew don't even debate with him it's a complete waste of time and he could actually ruin you don't debate other jews this is the reason why you're never going to see any normal from jew debate any of these heretics that are jews uh but the key is to understand that uh when chava responded to the snake she in essence started a dusia, started a conversation why because now he said something to her and she immediately she said no i want to defend the truth no you're saying that hashem said don't eat anything no it's not true he actually said don't eat from the uh uh from the tree of knowledge already that's mistake number one why mistake number one? Because people like that, people that are obviously mention things that are completely ludicrous and they're simply just trying to get your attention and are simply just trying to, you know, get some attention or trying to get a stage. You're not going to be able to influence these people because they're not coming to you in order to change their mind. They're not coming to you in order to learn the truth. They're coming to you in order to prove their case, in order to flex their muscles in order to you know uh, uh, make uh, themselves uh, known that's in essence what they're coming to you for and that was the snake so as soon as the uh, chava responded to the snake responded to the serpent that was already a mistake because that started the dialogue and of course since he was already prepared with all of the rebuttals in the world because he has an agenda he saw that chava made a mistake in her rebuttal what was the mistake that she added one particular thing oh okay yeah what you're saying that uh, hashem uh is allowing you to eat it's not from everything but you're saying that he uh that's fine okay i understand so he's not so uh but how come he says don't touch he caught her making a mistake that she didn't realize herself making a mistake he said oh, i could prove that wrong i could prove that that's a mistake how he pushed her on a tree and uh she uh, she uh hit the tree of knowledge and nothing happened she didn't die so in that sense, already, she was questioning herself, and that's, uh, everybody, everybody knows the rest of the story. Now, uh, when it comes to Adam, when it comes to Adam, why did Adam follow suit after the Chava? Adam wanted to serve a Kadosh Baruch Hu to the fullest extent. Adam was Kadosh. Adam was a Kadosh Baruch Hu's creation. Uh, everything is Hashem's creation, but he's literally creation from nothing. That he is the Hashem's hands created Adam Alishon. 
And Adam Rishon saw how wonderful the creation is that uh, he wanted to make sure that he's going to be able to thank Hashem properly because a, uh, Hashem gave him the wisdom and uh, he understood that you cannot be a good servant if you're going to benefit from Hashem's world without saying a blessing, without saying thank you. Unfortunately today, people are so focused on their own agendas, on their own desires, on their own... Uh, commands and demands from Hashem and from the people around them that many times they forget to say thank you and more times they spit on you and step on you and do all types of things to uh, without even uh, realizing that they forgot to even say thank you. Uh, people are just so wrapped up in their own ego they can't get out of their own way while they're stepping on everybody that helps them. And that's a reality. And needless to say, we do it to Akadosh Baruch Hu. Unfortunately, many times a person does not thank Hashem properly. He uh, eats without blessing. He, uh, you know, he uh, gets all types of things of benefits in the world without uh, thanking Hashem and realizing where it came from. Hence, the reason why there is actually a commandment in the Torah where Hashem says, "After I give you food and I give you sustenance and I give you everything, don't forget me." Which means that this is a very much a real thing. That it's not only that we forget Hashem, but we actually dafka, uh, forget Hashem after, uh, after He gives us everything that we want. So the snake saw that Chava made a mistake and he took advantage of it. But now you have a problem. Why? You have Adam. How do I convince Adam? To do what uh, you know, to to uh, to do what uh, I want him to do, which is he wants him to eat the fruit because he wants Hashem to kill Adam, so he could con- uh, consort with Chava. That's in essence was part of the reason of why uh, the uh, the serpent wanted uh, uh, them to eat from the fruit. He wanted Adam to die because he wanted to be with Chava. Uh, this is a little bit of Kabbalistic teachings of how the Tuma needs more from the Kedusha. It lives off of the Kedusha, the power of the Kedusha. So anyway, Adam knew that he needs to thank Hashem, but at the same token, he had extraordinary wisdom that's beyond our understanding. That And he understood that there is simply no way for him to thank Hashem forever because he's made out of flesh and blood. And therefore, his, uh, uh, his thinking of Hashem will be limited. Uh, and uh, because of that, he decided that uh, he wants to eat from the tree of knowledge in order to find out where the tree of life is, because the tree of life was in the middle of the garden, so he didn't know where the middle of the garden is. And therefore, he said, okay, let me eat from the tree of knowledge that will tell me where the tree of life is, and once I eat from the tree of life, I'll be able to live forever and serve Hashem forever. And in essence, he used his own warped logic to serve Hashem and Hashem punished him for it because he said no I don't want you to serve me the way you want I want you to serve me the way I want and that's in essence the mistake that many many people make uh with uh, with that being said before we continue I actually forgot uh to uh bless and to Hashem knows what's on my mind I even have it in front of my screen but Hashem uh, uh reminded me now that uh I forgot to bless and thank all of the supporters uh so uh the shio will be uh, from the beginning to uh, uh, to all of it and all of the people that watch it forever uh, be for the uh, merit and the refuah shlema of uh, Rabbanit Levana Bat Sara, Rabbi Ephraim Ben Shulamit, Rabbanit Sara Bat Anat, uh, David Ben Esriah, uh, Doris Bat Jora, uh, Itro Ben Avram, Talia Bat Sara, uh, Orit Bat Ilana, and uh, also for a atzlacha uh, raba of uh, Amir ben Shahin, uh, Netanel Yosef ben Avraham, uh, David ben Asriya, Oshri ben Doris, Gabi ben Doris, Elad ben Doris, uh, Ruben Chaim ben Palat Parel, Shaul ben Farzane, Marsha bat Juli, Ayla bat Marsha, Samuel ben Marsha, Sephas ben Marsha, Alexander ben Marsha, and Louis Ben Masha, Kadosh Baruch Hu, will bless each and every single one of them and all of the other wonderful supporters uh, that uh, continue to help us do all the amazing things that we're doing, Baruch Hashem. Uh, whether Jews or Gentiles, and I have a fantastic story for you guys, Bezat Hashem, soon, uh, about the blessing of a Chacham on a Gentile, Bezat Hashem. So anyway, 
uh, the uh, for all of you that ask how do I get on these uh, list one way one easy way to get on uh, the list if you need the flesh lima you go to our website bezotashem.org and uh, you can uh, uh, go to the store the uh, Bezat Hashem store and there's a refuah shlema uh thing over there you donate i think it's 180 dollars or 500 dollars uh i think for elin Nishma it's 500 dollars and for refuah shlema it's 180 and it helps us uh continue doing what we're doing it's not that uh we uh, won't say refuah shlema unless you donate the money i mean if you obviously are broke and you have no money we'll still say refuah shlema for you we'll still pray for you as we do with to countless people but nonetheless, if a person has the means, uh, then uh, you can uh, just do it on the website, and then we mention you in the shield once. So uh, all of these different wonderful people that uh, I mentioned, these are people that are either uh, involved with the uh, organization or people that, you know, as, as a, as a uh, uh, involved in so many words. These are supporters, these are helpers, these are people that are very, very committed to helping us on a regular basis, Baruch Hashem. Um, and again, even if you don't need to lift wash them out, somebody else needs it, or, or you simply just want the merit of being part of getting a blessing, uh, these are the places to do it. Uh, anyway, the, um, the the whole issue of Parashat uh, Bereshit, you have this whole story, we learn a lot of lessons of how Chava made a mistake by debating a missionary and giving him the stage and falling as a result. Uh, women until this day are suffering as a result of that original mistake and unfortunately we haven't learned our lesson because there are uh, countless people that uh, you know answer the uh, 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 the missionaries that come to them the heretics that come to them sometimes the missionaries come to them in a uh, you know with uh, telling them that they're Jewish but they're Jews that believe in idolatry of, of Yeshu and sometimes they're just outright heretics that don't believe in God. They just believe in their own version of God or believe something else. And they try to missionize and convince everybody else that's that's the truth and everybody else is clueless. So missionaries come in all forms and sizes. The best thing to do with missionaries, with heretics, with people that are vocal about their, uh, their disbelief in the Torah that, and, and the tradition that we have, is simply to avoid them like the plague. Don't debate them, don't do nothing. Avoid them like the plague. If the people are simply ignorant and, uh, and they're willing to listen, they're willing to review information, then of course you should send them information, you should send them our lectures and try to get them to wake up and realize that they're living a lie. But if they're missionaries, if they're coming to you with an agenda, either an agenda to convert you to some uh, form of uh, heresy or idolatry, or they're coming with uh, other types of agendas that are not in your best interest, simply run away. Don't debate them, not publicly, not privately, not even with a comment on the internet. Uh, that's why, for example, you'll see that uh, in my channel, sometimes you'll see uh, missionaries uh, every day, actually, you'll see in my channel, missionaries making comments, but if you follow the comments long enough, you'll see that those comments get deleted. Why? I simply don't, not only don't want to uh, debate them, I don't even want them to be there. I don't want anyone else to look at it. I don't want anyone else to look at their, uh, uh, at their uh, videos or the rest of their nonsense. Uh, this is the reason why we won't debate uh, any of these organizations that ask us to debate them because there's just no point. We know we have the truth. There's simply no, nothing to defend here. You only need to defend something if you're questioning yourself. But as far as uh, going against their their own uh, their heresy in order for the sake of uh, of educating the public, we don't need to do that on a debate platform. You can simply teach you on a shiu, and you can watch a shiu, and you can watch the uh, lectures. You can watch over sixty or seventy different lectures that Rabbi Ephraim uh, has made, uh, which many of them have been translated to uh, with subtitles to English. Uh, that uh, proves that the New Testament is 100% idol worship, 100% heresy, 100% garbage. Uh, if you watch his lectures and, uh, and you uh, spend the time reading and double-checking everything he says, you'll see the sources for everything. You'll see that simply the New Testament is spiritual poison for anybody that follows it, whether Jew or Gentile. Uh, and he has over 60, 70 lectures that he's done it, uh, any of their claims are, you know, he is, uh, he is the, that they've uh, said, 
he's taken them to town and have destroyed their claims. And uh, really one of the biggest things that they try to do is they try to uh, mock the Torah, mock the, uh, especially the, uh, the, the sages and the oral Torah in order to discourage people from actually double checking, in order to discourage people from seeing the truth. Same thing like the snake. The snake in essence just wants a stage. Once you give him the stage, he knows exactly what to do of how to use your words against you because he knows that you're not as good of a speaker as he is and you're not as prepared as he is and he has all of his weapons now you know as far as debating is concerned it's not a uh, lack of debate skills that is the reason why we're not debating because if that was the case i would be debating every single day but Hashem, that's part of what i did for a living for 20 years uh, and trust me when I tell you, it's a very big Yetzirah for me not to debate, or at least it used to be, because it was a very big part of what I did for almost 20 years. Uh, and I was relatively good at it, I could say. Uh, but uh, once I heard that this is what the Alakha is, this is what I need to do, this is what the Rav says, simple, that's it. He says, no, I do, I know, just like a good little boy. Uh, it's hard? Okay, let it be hard. So be it. But that's, that's the way it is. When an Apikos comes to you that's a Jew, when a heretic that's a Jew comes to you with an agenda, you don't debate them. You simply run away. Now, we move on to Parashat Noah. Parashat Noah is an extraordinary parasha where it starts with Noah is an East Sadiq Tamim. East Sadiq Tamim. Noah is a giant. Noah is Kadosh. Noah is Sadiq. Noah is Tamim. What Tamim? Tamim is complete with Hashem. Whatever Hashem said, Noach does. Simple. And uh, we, uh, we see actually that uh, the, the parasha goes in such a way where first it tells us about how Noach is such a righteous person and he's completely following what Hashem says. But then HaKadosh Baruch Hu looks at the rest of the people and it's simply a tragedy. Everybody was one worse than the other. So much so that it's a, uh, the, there's so much immorality. So much immorality in the land at the time of Noah that the, uh, there's men marrying men, women marrying women. There's so much homosexuality, perversion, immorality, stealing, filth, garbage. Everything that simply is the opposite of what Hashem uh, created the world for uh, there's so much filth in the world that it even impacts the animals and the ground uh, that Hashem has to simply uh, review everything and see what you know that he has to destroy it but the way that the verses are written is, is very interesting we learn a lot from it where it says in the uh, Parashat Noach that first Hashem says that that uh, the earth has become corrupt before God and the earth has become filled with robbery. So Chazal says that the last straw to simply push the world to a, uh, to a point where it lost its right to exist was that the people were stealing from each other. There wasn't even unity among them. Meaning when they were perverting, you know, the, the, the nature of things where instead of man marrying woman and, and being with, a, uh, with, with, with his wife, he was, marri- he was taking his friend's wife, committing adultery. He was marrying another man. She was marrying another woman. Uh, all types of, you know, things that are the opposite of what it's supposed to be. Similar to today, unfortunately. And, uh, but even with all of that immorality... When Hashem saw, at least maybe there's some type of unity, but once he saw that they're stealing from each other, they won't even allow each other to succeed in anything, that people would go to a guy's new store and instead of buying the uh, new food that he has, they say, can we taste it? And they take a few for free that they would taste. And say, okay, thank you and leave. And they would tell everybody else that he's got some new stuff and the whole neighborhood would come and everybody would just taste it for free. So much so that they finished the entire bag of goods without a single person paying for it. Simply robbing each other by using and perverting the law. Meaning they weren't breaking the law, like they weren't robbing each other by, uh, you know, uh, uh, breaking down the door with, uh, uh, with guns and knives and everything. No, they were perverting the law in such a way that they were doing things in a legal fashion. Similar to how people today uh, do conduct their business. Where they say, listen, I told you that I'll do the job. Uh, okay, you paid me all the money. 
Fine. Okay, but you didn't do the job. Well, I didn't tell you when I'm going to finish. No, actually, you did say. You said you're going to finish in August. Yeah, but I didn't say August of this year. You know, people will pervert the law. People will tell you different things and be vague in such a way. In essence, that they leave you hanging. You can't really do much about it. And unfortunately, that's just the reality. It's similar to how this uh, 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 situation is in the world. For all of you that are against the vaccine, this is a little bit of ammunition for you, which I'm sure you know. Uh, not that I'm for or against it. I personally didn't take the vaccine, nor do I recommend for or against. I've already spoken my piece about that whole part, which is simply you have to listen to the sages. But one thing about the, the vaccine that's very interesting is that the, uh, the all the lawyers out there, whether it's in Israel or in America, they made sure that the, the companies, Pfizer and Johnson & Johnson, whoever else is involved in this, are uh, get the government to simply absolve them from any possible lawsuits. Meaning, if somebody takes this medicine and dies, gets a heart attack, gets all types of bleeding, gets all types of tragedies, they have no responsibility, which is like uh, the, uh, the legal department's dream. Simply, there's no ramifications, there's no consequences for anything. And that's, in essence, a, a, uh, a world full of Hamas. That's a corrupt world. Why? Because if you have no consequences for your actions, why will you be careful? If there's no consequences for your actions, why will you care to tell the truth if it hurts your agenda? If all you care about is making money, then what do you care about if people are dying or, or, or it's curing or it's not curing? I mean, why do you care? You already made the money. So that's the thing. When, once you take out the consequences for things, corruption is at its highest level, like in an instant. It's not even like it starts, uh, corruption starts. As soon as you take away the consequences, as soon as there's no more jail, as soon as they, you know, uh, the, all the criminals out there, political criminals out there, they want to defund the police. As soon as something like that happens, that's it. The world goes from zero or whatever level of corruption it's at to 100%. Like it doesn't get, it can't get worse than that. Because once you remove consequences, once there is no consequences for things, that's it. People will eat each other alive. And that's why the Mishnah and Avot says that a Jew has to pray not just for his own well-being and not only for his own country's well-being, but even the well-being of the, of the governments of the Goim. Why? Because if it wasn't for these governments, people will eat each other alive. But once the governments themselves become corrupt to the extent where they're removing the law, uh, like they do with uh, with financial matters where the government in, in the United States and I'm sure in other countries, they're allowed to do things uh, that is illegal for the rest of the people, whether it's insider trading or all types of manipulations and so on. They're allowed to take advantage of these things while other people that do it, they go to jail for many years. So that type of corruption is, is, is horrible. But once you take the, the consequences across the board out of the equation, Corruption is officially at 100%. Like, it doesn't get worse than that. It doesn't matter where you started. Once there's no consequences, that's it. And that's also why you'll see many times the people that the, uh, that uh, you see that desecrate Hashem's name and, uh, you know, in, 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 in such a way where they pretend to be religious, they look religious, they have a beard, they have a kisui rosh, they look this, but then they end up being a pedophile. Then they end up, you know, uh, being a corrupt in business and lying and cheating people and, che and, and doing all types of things. You'll see one common denominator. Those people do not believe in consequences. They do not know anything about Geinom. They don't know anything about Kafakela. And even if they heard about it, they don't believe in it. They think it's a Christian belief. And that's in essence why there are so many people that would listen to these speakers out there uh, and, uh, you know, the religious speakers, rabbis, but still those fans are going to remain corrupt, corrupt in their business, corrupt in their marriages. She's still cheating on her husband. He's still cheating on the government. They're still cheating on each other. They're still lying. They're still uh, wasting uh, seed and being immoral. They're still desecrating Shabbat. Like you can literally have an entire generation of people where you have people that look religious at times, sometimes don't look religious, but a huge fan base, a huge fan base that each one goes to different rabbis, and you'll see 
that those people that listen to these corrupt rabbis that not only do not speak about uh, um, a reward and punishment, but actually speak against it, like the Manus Friedmans of the world and Mezas and Dolkasutas and so on, those people that speak against reward and punishment, you'll see that all of their fans, all of them, without an exception, are corrupt people. Just simply, if, if there was a way to double check it, I'll, I'll be willing to pay for it. Like, you'll see. If you investigate those people's lives, they're all corrupt in one way. She is probably cheating on her husband. He's probably cheating on his wife. Or they're cheating in business. Or they're lying to the government. Or they're, they're, they're just corrupt people. Why? Because that speaker, that source of motivation that they have, that source of inspiration that they have, is teaching them a corrupt ideology, which is that there's no consequences for your actions. And if there's no consequences for their actions, then great. I can do whatever I want. And that's in essence how you have somebody could look a hundred percent religious, but be the biggest criminal in the world. I mean, you, we saw it in Australia. This uh, wicked, disgusting excuse of a human being, woman that was uh, the uh, principal of a girl seminary, uh, literally raped. Uh, I don't know something like uh, almost a hundred little girls. Like, if you look at this woman, she looks as religious as it could possibly be. She almost covers her eyes with the kisugosh that she has. But she is a monster, monster. And it was recently reported that uh, they, uh, they caught her lying. She said that she was, uh, the lawyer said she was crazy and can't be tried. She flee to Israel. Long story short, they're now extraditing. Oh, they already did extradite her to be uh, charged in uh, Australia. And Bezal Hashem shall go uh, and get the maximum punishment. Bezal Hashem. Now, a person like that, you're not allowed to have mercy on them. Anyone that has a mercy on such a person they know, is a wicked person. You're not allowed to have mercy on people like this. There's a, there are certain types of criminals, simply you're not allowed to have mercy on them. That's why this is one of the things that we have uh, uh, that's a, uh, an opposite uh, of uh, the ideology of Christianity. Because Christianity teaches you, if he slaps you on one cheek, give him the other cheek. Uh, if, as long as he believes in Yoshke, he goes to uh, heaven. Meaning that according to uh, to the Christians, even somebody like Hitler goes to heaven. Osama bin Laden goes to heaven. All of these people go to heaven if they believe in Yoshke. So this is obviously a warped ideology that's actually a source of evil in the world. So it's important to know that uh, when there, people are taught that there's no consequences or that all the consequences are removed, if you just do this one simple thing, Corruption is there. And that's in essence what happened here where the whole world became corrupt. Immorality was running rampant. And what ended up happening is what the, what the verses say here is that Vayomer Elohim lenoach Ketz kol basar ba lefanai Ki mal'a aretz chamatz mipneem V'hineni mashchitam et aretz Very interesting use of words here where Hashem says, God says to Noach The end of all flesh has come before me. For the earth is filled with corruption, with robbery through them, and behold, I am about to destroy them from the earth. So here we see a couple of things. Here we see a couple of things. First and foremost, we see the tendency of Hashem to mention things multiple times, which we'll get to in a, maybe in a moment. I, you know, we're kind of running out of time. I want you guys to ask questions. But we see that Hashem, when He says certain things, especially decrees of, 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 uh, of judgment, we see Him repeat the same thing multiple times. And He repeats multiple times that He's going to destroy the world, not just in this verse multiple times, but also later on. He keeps telling Noah, I'm going to destroy the world, destroy the world, destroy the world. And when He tells Moshe Rabbeinu at the end of the Torah that He's not going to go to... Uh, uh, Eretz Yisrael, he's not going to go to Eretz Yisrael, he's not going to go to Eretz Yisrael. Then he tells them, you're going to die, you're going to die, you're going to die. And he keeps mentioning these things, these ends. Apparently, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, when he says these things, he knows his creation is not really uh, capable of understanding the full ramifications of such a ending decree, such a game over, such a uh, 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 situation where you can't really get the full picture of what does it mean? Okay, so a person dies. All right, so that means I won't be able to see them anymore. Shem says, no, no, he's going to die. 
oh, okay, so I'm not going to see them anymore, and I won't be able to talk to them anymore. Right, he's going to die. Oh, okay, I'm not going to see him anymore. I'm not going to talk to him anymore. I can't write them anymore, obviously. Um, oh, wait a minute. Oh, there's Olam Abba. So he, the body is, 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 is not here. Uh, that becomes food for the worms and maggots. But he, he, or her, her, the real version of them, their beginning life, in essence, judgment begins. If they're righteous, they get heaven. If they're wicked, they get gain. Uh, and then, oh, so now, oh, so, wow. And you start thinking, oh, so that, that's, that's, that's a lot of stuff. What happens there? And you start calculating. Hashem says, no, gonna, it's the end. It's the end. And every time a person thinks about it, it's the end, it's the end, starts realizing, oh, there is a, uh, uh, a lot and that's in essence one of the reasons that Hashem uh, mentions the uh, these ending decrees, these heavy decrees, multiple times, because He knows that we cannot comprehend the full ramification, the full picture of what it means after one time. And plus, it obviously emphasizes that we need to learn more. But I'm sure that there's countless other sages uh, out there, uh, countless sages out there to discuss other other reasons. But also we see here that uh, the second point that we learned from this verse where Hashem says to Noah that the end of all flesh has come before me uh, for the earth is filled with robbery through them and behold I'm about to destroy the world that we see that there is a certain order to the words meaning that Hashem says to Noah the end of all flesh has come before me and at the end he says I'm going to destroy the world. So what does that really mean when you, when you analyze it? If you look at the commentary by, by Rashi, is that in essence, Hashem is trying to tell uh, Noah, he's trying to teach us that the immorality in the world has reached such a high level that simply the actions of people led to them losing their right to exist. And therefore, Hashem says, I'm going to execute this and thereby, thereby eliminate their existence. Meaning that it's not, I'm punishing them. It's that their actions, their actions, them pressing the button over and over and over and over again, led to the button breaking. And therefore, the whole machine, I'm throwing out the machine. The machine is, is in the garbage. I didn't tell them to go do this. I didn't tell them they should do this. I didn't even tell them that they could do this. They did it over and over and over and over and over again to the point where they have forfeited their right to exist. And that's in essence one of the things that we can learn a lot of Musar from where when a person has problems in their life, you financial issues, marriage issues, uh, children, whatever it is. The Gemara in Masechet Brachot says, Afochba ve'afochba, look into your actions, look into your actions, look into your actions. Why look into my actions? Because Hashem is not making life difficult for you for no reason. Don't look for some rabbi or some baba or some uh, miracle worker to fix your life. There's no such thing. The only one that can fix your life is you. You have me. If you want to go to a Talmud Chacham, a rabbi, to tell you, uh, you know, different things you need to do as far as if you don't know how to do tshuva, you don't know how to learn, you don't know what mitzvot are, you don't know which direction to go, how to go, fine. But if you think that some rabbi is going to bless you and that's going to fix everything despite your horrible actions, it doesn't work that way. It simply doesn't work that way. You have to help yourself you have to do things for your own neshama many times people say oh what can i do for the ilui nishma of my grandfather what can i do for the ilui nishma of my uh, such and such person you could do a lot of things for them but did you ever do anything for your own neshama did you ever do anything to prepare your own neshama for what happens after this body dies oh no well, my kids will do it well who says that your kids are going to do it? Who says that your kids are going to do it? Why are you waiting for your kids to do it? Why don't you do something for yourself? First and foremost, you need to do tshuva. Second of all, you need to make sure 
that uh, you prepare, you prepare yourself, you take all of the mitzvot you possibly can do, all the chesed you can do, all the things you could possibly do for yourself. Don't wait for your kids to do it or for somebody to do it for you. And think that just because you did it for somebody else, they'll do it for you. It doesn't necessarily work that way all the time. You have to do things for your own neshama. Don't wait for other people to do it for you. And don't go to a rabbi or to somebody and say, oh, can you fix my problem? No one can fix your problems. And that's one of the things that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is in essence trying to tell us, if I'm giving you problems if, if, and there's a horrible thing out there, that's because you did something to earn that. You did something to earn that. And therefore, you need to do something to change it. But if a person doesn't get the message, they could literally lose their right to exist. If they're continuing to sin, it's already bad. If they're continuing to make other people sin, it's a completely different level of bad. And what happened at the time of Noah is that people were sinning, causing other people to sin, doing everything wrong. So much so that they lost the right to exist. And Hashem says, that's it. Game over. I'm destroying this, uh, this world. Now, later on, we see something very interesting. We see that it says in the... Uh, uh, so it says in a uh, verse number uh, 22 in uh, chapter 6 uh, and 21 that uh, as for you, Take for yourself of every food. No, I'm sorry. It's a. Uh, yeah, yeah, point of. Okay, so it says, uh, uh, "As for you, take for yourself uh, of every food that is eaten uh, and gather it into yourself uh, uh, for yourself." Okay, and then it says, "Noah did according." To everything God commanded him, so he did. Then Hashem said to Noah, Come to the ark, you and all of your household, for it is you that I have seen to be a tzaddik, righteous, before me in this generation. So you see a couple of things. You see that Noah did everything that Hashem tzivauto, commanded him. And thereby, Hashem calls him a tzaddik again. He called him a tzaddik already in the beginning of the parasha, where he says, Noach ish tzaddik tamim. First verse of the parasha, Noach was a righteous man. And then he tells Noach, Noach, by the way, you're a tzaddik. Why am I a tzaddik? Why am I a tzaddik? Because you did everything that HaKadosh Baruch Hu commanded you. But then there's an interesting midrash. There's an interesting midrash. It says, and it's even in the Gemara, that uh, um, after the Mabul, after the Mabul, after the flood, Noah comes out of the ark and he sees the whole world is destroyed. All of the people that he knew are gone. And he starts crying. And he says to Hashem, this, for this, this is what you did. You destroyed the whole world. And then HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to Noah, Raya Shatya, you are a drunk shepherd. What kind of leader are you? What kind of shepherd are you? You're, 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 you're like a drunk. Why a drunk? He says, had you cried, had you cried before the flood, perhaps it would have been enough of a merit to give the people more time, even though I gave them many, many years, centuries. And even after I told you to build the ark that would take you over a hundred years, I specifically did it so they could come to you and ask you, and instead of coming to you and asking you, instead of coming to you and asking you, uh, you know, a, uh, what are you doing? And you tell them it's, uh, Hashem's going to bring them a bull. What they do? They came to you, they asked you, and they made fun of you. And they made fun of Hashem. And they thought the whole thing is a big joke. You told them about that there's a punishment coming, and they made fun of it. It's like somebody makes a shield about Genom, somebody makes a shield about Tikkun Abrit. Instead of the person doing Tshuva, what does he do? He makes fun of it. Ah, this is crazy. These people are fanatic. It's only natural. My doctor told me. My boyfriend told me. My girlfriend told me. My dog told me. Everybody told me. 
And a person, instead of doing tshuva, they in essence make fun of the Torah. There's nothing worse than that. Simply nothing worse than that. Rabbi Yisrael Misalan says in all Israel uh, that uh, when a person rejects Musa, rejects a rebuke, they in essence sign a decree on themselves. They sign an evil decree on themselves. So here we see that uh, Noah cried, but after the fact. After the fact. But yet, despite crying after the fact and Hashem rebuking him for it, that doesn't change the status of him being a tzaddik. He's still a tzaddik. Why is he a tzaddik? Because he did everything that Hashem commanded him. Now, is it wrong to be a tzaddik? On Vayalena, we can all be tzaddikim. But what is it? What is it? Uh, what is? What is? What am I getting to here? A kadosh Baruch Hu says, Noach, you are a tzaddik. You did everything I commanded you, and therefore this is the result. Meaning, I commanded you to build the ark. You built the ark. You went into the ark, you brought the animals, and here you are, you're alive to repopulate the world. That's what I, you listen to what I said. You're a tzaddik, you're a righteous person. But now you're crying that the damage happened. That's a problem. Why is it a problem? Because if you want the world to change, it's not enough to be a tzaddik. You have to be a chassid. What's a chassid? A dear friend of mine, Talmud Chacham, showed me this Gemara this week. And it made me think. You look at the Gemara in Masechet Baba Kama. Masechet Baba Kama, page 30, 38. Uh, And the Gemara says, talks about the Chachamim, how they were so careful about everything, where if they had some type of material that was hazardous, whether it was broken glass or anything else, they would dispose of it in, in very, very unique ways. Where even though they could stick this broken glass or whatever it is in some wall, they didn't do it. Why? They made sure to go and put it in a uh, place where no one can get it. They would dig it into the ground, bury it deep enough where even if it rained, it wouldn't come out. It says, Rav Yudah says... These are the Hasidim. These are the Hasidim. Why? These are the Hasidim. Why? They go above and beyond. They go above and beyond. Say that the, uh, uh, the uh, devout people of the earlier generations would hide their thorns and shards of glass in their fields and uh, make a hole for them. And uh, so they would not be able to uh, block the plow, they, they, meaning that nobody would get hurt from these things. These are the, these are the Hasidim. These are the real Hasidim from 2,000 years ago plus. So, Gemara asks, how do you become a Hasid? Why, if I just uh, take all my uh, bad stuff and bury it, that makes me a Hasid? So comes Rav Yudah and says, whoever wishes to become a chassid, here now is the instructions. First and foremost, he should fulfill the words of Masechet Nezikin. What's Masechet Nezikin? Masechet Nezikin is really Baba Kama, Baba Batra, Baba Metzia. It's really all one Masechet. It's called Masechet Nezikin, which is the... Uh, um, the uh, uh, the laws between one person and another as far as how you can damage another person in, in business, stealing, cheating, uh, fraud, charging interest, all of the different issues that a person can hurt another person are in one of these three uh, tractates. It used to be one tractate, but it's so big, they broke it up into one. All of the bava, all the bava masechtot, those are masechet nezikim. A person that becomes, wants to become a chassid has to be an expert. An expert in Masechet Nezikin. Why? If you're an expert in all the possible ways that you could hurt somebody else, then you'll avoid them. You'll know exactly what to avoid. You'll know that you can't talk to people in a certain way. Why? Because it could hurt them. You can't charge people certain things. Why? Because it could hurt them. You can't walk a certain way. You can't look a certain way. You can't act a certain way. You can't do business a certain way. You can't do all types of things. 
if you become an expert in all of these things you already have taken one step to to it becoming a real chassid not one of these people that's a chassid just by looks there's a lot of people in the world that are chassidim as far as the looks they have the different exterior looks whether it's the seat the seat on the outside or the uh, or, or, or the jackets or the hats or the beard or this or that but in reality many times some of these people are the most corrupt people on planet earth not all of them many many tzadikim but there are some people that you'll see these corrupt people in casinos in in in, in clubs in the shem yachem all types of garbage and some of them you'll even see them speaking on youtube as uh, and going talking against god saying that god needs you all types of things so a chassid first and foremost is an expert in the issues of nezikin which is the matters between one person and another in order to know how to avoid hurting anybody else all of the laws that have to do with governing the relationship between one man and his fellow so that's step number one of becoming a chassid not all of it just step number one Gemara continues and says also he should fulfill the words of Masechet Avot what's Masechet Avot Masechet Pirkei Avot we have a whole series 179 lectures on Masechet Avot a person that learns Masechet Avot and not just learns it superficially studies it spends a few hours on each of the Mishnayot to understand what's being said applies as much of it as possible as often as possible to his life will know how to correct their midot their horrible midot whether it's stinginess or it's arrogance or it's anger or it's uh promiscuity or whatever it is all the negative traits that a person has if they want to fix them you have to become an expert in pirkei avot and if you do that that is step number two of becoming a chassid or a chassida now you can start with it and it'll be step number one for you but either way this is one of the things you have to number one don't hurt be an expert in how to manage relationships with other people step number two be an expert in knowing how to manage yourself how to overcome your own obstacles your own bad traits but that's not it you want to be a real chassid you said real chassid requires step number three what's step number three he should also fulfill the words of Masechet Brachot. What's Masechet Brachot? All of the ways of the different things to bless. Why do you need to? Why do I need to be an expert in blessings? Because if a person is an expert in all of the ways to bless Hashem for all of the things that Hashem provides them, whether they look bad or they look good whether it's food or it's uh, some other form of sustenance or it's something else in the world whatever HaKadosh Baruch Hu brings you you know exactly how to bless Hashem and you don't only know the blessing you also know how to do the blessing how much cover not to put them do the blessing you put the right effort into it because the Chachamim say that a person that does not put Kavana into his blessings and bless Hashem in some uh, robotic way he doesn't really care what he says who what when and how he'll get punished for all those blessings there's a whole uh Yalkut Yosef there's a Yalkut Yosef I uh, read uh, during uh, Sukkot where he gives a uh, story from the sages where they talk about how a person goes to uh Shemaim, goes to Shemaim after fulfilling the uh you know his, his whole life and the uh this whole um uh, example is written in Kafa Chaim Sofer uh Adam. it's mentioned in many places and the Yakut Yosef by the Rishon Etzion said the person fulfilled the mitzvot he was a prominent Torah scholar he learned Torah he did mitzvot he did a lot of good things go up to Shemaim they asked him in Shemaim did you fulfill the uh written Torah he says yes Did you fulfill the oral Torah he says yes you care okay and they say finally the judges in the bed dean of Shemaim ask him we're not talking about a regular person even. we're talking about somebody a Torah scholar a and a kolel. 
Say, were you careful not to pronounce God's name in vain? Now, since the Neshama can't lie, he didn't answer. And the judges in Shammai continued to ask for a testimony. Suddenly, a horde of angels dressed in black, Malachi Chabala, arrived and testified. Each one saying, I came into being on this particular date when this man pronounced God's name during his prayer without paying any attention to the name's meaning. Meaning he was saying Hashem like he says Shmuley, like he says Mikey, like he says Stevie. And at that, the judges in heaven stood up, rent their garments, they ripped their clothes, like somebody died. And the person that was being judged also ripped his clothes, rent his garments. And then the chief judge in the bedding of heaven turned and looked at this man and thundered at him, saying, you drop of filth, how did you dare do such a thing? And sentenced him to go to Gainom, or be reincarnated into the physical world and redo his whole life just for that. Rabotai Karim, a person that does not know how to bless Hashem, not only cannot be a chassid, his delusion that he thinks that he's going to have Gan Eden just because he does a little bit of mitzvot here and there whenever he gets a chance, it's so far from the truth. Now, to be a chassid, Rabotai, to call yourself a chassid, to be known as a chassid is a very big deal according to the Torah. You want to try it? Go for it. But you have to know how to think Hashem. Thank Him for the good, thank Him for the bad. Thank Him for the food, thank Him for all of the different things you benefit from. You cannot benefit from anything in this world without thanking Hashem. And a person has to put as much kavanah as possible on every blessing, which is not, it's not difficult to do, but it's extremely difficult to do. Meaning, it's not difficult to do if you're really thinking about it. The problem is that the Yitzhak puts our mind in 500 places that Many times, we're simply not thinking about that we say Hashem's name like we say Mikey, like we say Stevie. That's the problem. You have to say Hashem's name with Kavanah. Needless to say, you have to think Hashem. And not think that you did anything. Hashem is everything. So the Gemara says, you want to be a Chassid, you have to be an expert in Nezikin, in Avot, in Masechet Avot, in Masechet Brachot. That's a Yuvah Hasid. That's Yuvah Hasid. All of those Sadiqim you see in the Gemara I mentioned, they buried their uh, shards of glass and everything else. That's not what made them a Hasid. That was simply part of them performing their Hasidut. They made a million and a half other things they did in order to be Hasidim. So now, in essence, what the Gemara is trying to tell us, if you want to be a Hasid, you have to do above and beyond what a Kadosh Baruch Hu commands you. Above and beyond what a Kadosh Baruch Hu commands you. Now, Noah was each tzaddik, which means what? Noah did everything Hashem commanded him. Hashem rebukes Noah. He says, Noah, you did everything I commanded you, and therefore the world operated in a certain order, meaning all of the wicked died. You, the righteous, lived. But if you want me to change the natural and do something supernatural, in essence, you want me to give them more time to do tshuva, you want me to not punish them, you want me to do all types of things, then you have to do something. If you have a lot of difficulty in your life, you have lawsuits against you, you have people trying to kill you, both spiritually and, and physically in every way. You are a heartbroken. You have a disease, Hashem Yishmol Vietzid. You have financial crisis. You have a decree. And it doesn't matter, you bless and you pray and it's not working. It's not working. You go to a rabbi, rabbi pray, it's not working. That means that there's a decree. There's a decree. Somebody has a critical disease. Somebody has a critical situation. There's a decree. You want Hashem? to do something supernatural for you. The government says, we're taking you to jail on such and such date. 
The doctor says on such and such date, this person's probably going to die within a couple of weeks. You want something not supernatural. You want Akadosh Baruch to change the nature of the world. How? He's God. Okay, but why would he do it for you? Why would he do it for you? If you do something that's above and beyond your nature. You do something that's above and beyond your nature. You give more of yourself. You commit more of yourself. You do more. Not the standard. Don't think that if you just do the standard, it's enough. You have to do above and beyond. Above and beyond. If you do the standard, then you're simply a tzaddik. You're following the the, the way of the world is going to work. But if you want something above and beyond, you have to be chassid. You have to do above and beyond. What's above and beyond? Don't just become religious. Help other people become religious. It's good that you're religious. It's good that you're keeping Shabbat. It's good that you're good. Chazaku Baruch. Chazakau Bukhadi. You're doing what you're doing. But if you want Hashem to be treating you on a different level than everybody else, then you have to do above and everybody else. You have to do above everybody else. Everybody else is watching about their own life. They're like Noach, Tzaddik. You want to be like Chassid? You want a treatment that's above and beyond? You have to be above and beyond. This Rabotai is one of the things that HaKadosh Baruch Hu mentions. He, he, he rebukes Noach. How can you possibly expect the world to not get the judgment? I told you a bunch of times. I gave you an opportunity you did not go out of your way to go teach them Musar and say you waited for anybody that came to you you told them listen Hashem's going to destroy the world and then when they made fun of you you made fun of you what are you going to do if you want for me not to destroy the world you would have had to go looking for people looking for people in the street who can I help who can I help you can't go look for people you don't have the strength get somebody else to do it for you pay for it do whatever you can to get it done. Why? You want Hashem to be treating you differently than nature, than the nature that he, that he instilled in, 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 into the world, then you have to do something supernatural. But not just a one-time thing. On a regular basis, you have to be chassid. Chassid in Masechet, Nezikin, anytime somebody hurts you, anytime somebody mocks you, what do you do? Nothing. Nothing you do. She made fun of you. He made fun of you. No problem. What about if they come for you for help? How can I help you? What do you mean? He mocked you yesterday. He made fun of you yesterday. Okay, he made fun of me. So what? He needs help. He's a Jew. He needs help. I'm going to try to help him. If he made fun of God, it's a different story. If he made fun of me, okay, I'll still help him. I'll still help him. It's not so simple. It's not so simple to be a Hasid. But if a person wants to be a Hasid, it's a big deal. That's a big deal. Now, the uh, last thing I know we're a little bit over time, but I'll give you the story. It's worth it's worth worth uh, delaying the questions just for this story. I'll give you an example of how Kadosh Baruch Hu, the Midat Hasidut that Hashem has is not just for Jews only, it's also for Gentiles. Anybody that does, does above and beyond. And again, above and beyond may seem to you at this point like it's impossible because you're barely surviving with the basics. But let's give you an example of how above and beyond for, at certain times of your life is a lot less than you think. My grandparents are from Tunis, Tunisia, Tripoli. And uh, many years ago, there was a big chacham in Tunis. His name was a uh, Rav Tzemach Tzarfati. Rav Tzemach Tzarfati was a Talmud Chacham dedicated to Torah, Ish Tzadik. And Rav Tzarfati, he used to wake up at midnight every day and start his day at midnight. How did he start his day? Learning Torah. Now in those days, you didn't have electricity and, and, and the things that we have of today. So if you wanted to uh, light fire, it was a process to have a fire. So many people would have a candle Oh, you know, on all the time. But one night, Rav Tzarfati saw that, to his dismay, the uh, candle that he has on at all times got turned out. Got turned out. It's the middle of the night. What am I going to do? On one end, it's late. Can't just go knock on people's doors. On another end, I have to learn Torah. 
Torah is on the line. She says, ah, I'm going to go next door to the bakery. The, uh, the Gentile that works over there, I'm going to ask him to light my uh, candle. So, Rav Tzemach Tzafati goes, middle of the night, knocks on the door, doesn't work, knocks a little bit more, and then all of a sudden he hears a voice, a very tired voice, who's there? And Rav Tzafati says, oh, it's, it's me, Tzemach Tzafati, the, the, the rabbi. The uh, Gentile gets out of bed, doesn't want to, but he knows that the Rav is a big deal, not only for the Jews, but also for the Goyim. Everybody knows the Rabbi is a holy man. Now, the uh, he used this, 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 this Goy used to uh, sleep inside the bakery in order to protect the bakery from anybody robbing it or anything, but in order to, the, the door had a wooden plank that was extremely heavy that he had to lift in order to open the door. So the last thing this guy wants to do is open the door, but what is he gonna do? He's knocking on the door in the middle of the night. Gets out of bed, goes, picks up this really heavy plank, opens the door, is yes, for the Rav. And the Rav says, I'm sorry to bother you. I know it's late at night, but my candle is out. I need to learn Torah, please. Light my candle. He lets him inside. It was a very, very cold night. And he lights his candle, and the Rav says, thank you very much, and he leaves. After literally halfway to get into his house, wind comes, the candle's out. Shem Yishmol V'yatzim. Rav Tzalfati feels bad, but what am I going to do? I have to learn Torah. He goes back to the bakery. Knocks on the door. This time, what's going on? What happened? Oh, it's Tzemach Tzafati, the, the, the rabbi. Please, open the door for me. My, my candle is out. Oof. You know, this, this guy wants to sleep. He worked hard all day. What is he going to do? Goes, picks up the plank, heavy as can be, opens the door, lights his candle. Okay, good night. He takes five, six uh, uh, steps. Candles out. He doesn't know what can I do. Gets the courage. Goes back in there. Knocks on the door. Oh, no. What happened now? Who's there? We're not selling anything. Oh, no, no. It's me. Tzemach Salfati. Please, please. My candle is out. Rabbi, I need to sleep. Rabbi. I know, I'm sorry, it's not, it's not on purpose, I'm really sorry, please. Opens the door, lifts the plank, heavy as can be. Okay, yalla. He takes, he gets halfway to his house, and ishtabach shimo la'ad, the candle is out a fourth time. Now, this time already, four times, the rabbi is embarrassed. He's, he doesn't even understand what to do. But at the same token, Torah is on the line. What, can, what other option do I have? For people that are Talmidei Chachamim, they understand everything that I mean. What do you mean, not learn Torah? Let the world explode, I need to learn Torah. What do you mean? Yeah, but you're, gonna, you're, you're causing somebody anguish. Yeah, you're right. How do I not cause people anguish? Yeah, but this, but that. And you start arguing in your head. The Chacham Tzavati argued in his head and said, I got to go back one more time. He goes a fourth time to the bakery. He knocks on the door. And the baker says, I'm not opening the door. Go away. The rabbi starts begging, please, please. I, 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 I beg you, please, please. After some begging, the uh, baker says, okay, fine. He gets up, he's exhausted, because not only is he tired from a long day now, he starts from lift, lifting this huge plank. It's like lifting a whole tree every time. And he opens the door and he says, Rabbi, look at this plank, look at this wood that I have to lift. Every time I open the door, please, Rabbi, let me sleep. It's heavy, I'm tired. Rabbi, for the first time, sees what this guy has to do to lift the door. 
and he sees is it's not just he's tired and he wants to go to sleep Mamash, it's hard to open the door and the rabbi fati gives the goy a blessing may akadosh baruch Hu bless you to give you this weight in gold and you have a lot of success you become very rich the goy is so happy he never got such a blessing from a Talmud Chacham. And he knows this blessing from a Talmud Chacham, a Kadosh Baruch is going to answer it. Even though he's not Jewish, he knows that a Kadosh Baruch listens to the Chachamim. Kabbalah Masechet Sukkah, page 14, says, a Chacham, a Talmud Chacham, a Tzadik, makes a blessing, a Kadosh Baruch changes nature for them. Changes nature for them. The Goy is so excited about this, all of a sudden he doesn't care that he just had to lift this thing for the fourth time, 50 times. He is as happy as can be, Shtabach Shimon. Okay. He lights his candle, he goes on his way, and Rav Tzarfati goes and learns Torah. A little while later, maybe about a week or two later, this baker is, on his, uh, is in the market, and all of a sudden this very honorable person comes up to him, says, hey you, you want to work? And the baker says, what? He goes, you can't work for me. I'll pay you a lot of money. He says, how much money? Because last time the guy told me to make a lot of money, he's sleeping in a bakery. What's a lot of money? He says, I'll pay you ten times whatever you make right now. He says, who? Ten times? You know how much I make? He goes, how much do you make? He says, I make two real a day. He says, okay, no problem. I'll pay you twenty. And he sees the guy's clothes are worth more than his house. So it's not a... It's okay, fine. You gotta come with me. So hold on a second, I gotta tell my boss that I can't come to the bakery. I gotta take this job. And then I'll come back. So he goes to his boss. He tells him, listen, I'm sorry. I have to have a job. I have an opportunity, but I'll come back. I'll come back, but I have to go take this opportunity. Make pays me more money. The baker doesn't care. I mean, uh, getting uh, people to work is easy. So... He lets him go. He goes and uh, follows this rich man. And after they walk and they go and they're on the carriage and so on, and at some point, he says to him, okay, if you don't mind, I'm going to take this handkerchief that I have. I have to cover your eyes. Why? He says, because I don't want you to know how to get to where we're going. It's a secret, and I don't need anybody to know. So fine. He puts the handkerchief, covers his eyes. A little while later, they get to a place. And he gets into a house. He says, okay, Khan. He takes off the handkerchief and he opens up his eyes and he sees a room full of boxes. And the boxes are open, wooden boxes are open. And every single one of them is full of gold coins. Full of gold coins. I mean, he couldn't even imagine how much money is in this room? And the rich man says to him, listen, this is why I had to cover your, your face. Now the job is, I need you to sort out all the different coins. I have coins from all different places, but I need to sort them out. So you have to sort every single one of them. You need to be here for probably about a week. I left you all food and everything that you need and drinks and everything to be here. And I'll come back and pick you up when the job is over. Okay. So this baker starts working, separating everything. There's a lot of money in there. And he's doing his job. And he says, oh, Baruch Hashem, you know, the, the rabbi blessed me. I'm going to make money. And uh, okay, look, I already have 20 uh, uh, 10 times my living. Already things are looking good. Okay, fine. He's working, working, working. After a week or two worth of work, the, uh, he finishes the job, and the, uh, the rich man not only pays him the money, but even gives him a bonus. Ah, oh, Hashem. He uh, goes on his way, and he goes back to the bakery. A short while later, literally a matter of days, there's an announcement in the street Attention, 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 government message. So all of the townspeople come to the market to hear what's the, what's, what's, what's the government's message. 
Here, here, there is a auction that will take place tomorrow at such and such time, at such and such address. What's the auction? Whoever wants to buy this property is going to be able to bid because the owner was a person that uh, came from out of town who was living in this very beautiful property and uh, he died and he left no descendants and therefore the government does not want to deal with this property they don't have anybody that needs it and therefore the government would rather just take the money and sell you know from sell sale of the property so whoever wants to buy the property is a uh, welcome so of course everybody loves loves auctions opportunity to get a deal and the guy the baker heard this he said you know i wish i could buy this property maybe maybe i could put a down payment on it and it'll give me some time to get the property he decides you know what let me go look the next day everybody gathers and they see the property the baker is astonished that when he sees the property he says this must be this is it this is where i worked for those two weeks this is the place now he wants to go see but the whole place is blocked off no one is allowed to go inside you buy the property as is whatever all the furniture and everything that's in it comes with the property if there's problems it's your problems and he says to himself the rabbi's blessing is coming true this is the property but i'm gonna buy it so they start the auction one of the rich people there says i'll pay 500 500 gold coins or 500 real another guy says i'll pay a thousand next guy says 1500 another one says 2000 then all of a sudden the baker says 10000 real 10000 real is a lot of money but it's not uh, millions it's a lot of money but the rich people are looking at it and they see this guy with clothes like a homeless person they start laughing oh, who is this guy is he crazy he's making fun of us and they're so baffled by the fact that this poor guy is bidding on the property that they don't even pay attention to the auction going no one bids and he ends up winning the bid offer of ten thousand so now he has some money that he made from working for the guy and he says to the guy hey, i'll give you here some money that's what i have on me i'll give you the rest tomorrow the government member doesn't care okay fine here's the minute this is yours here's the keys the baker goes inside goes into the room opens up and he sees gold 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 everywhere and he knows that the rabbi Tzemach Tzarfati's blessing came true he became filthy rich but he's scared that if everybody finds out that this is what he has and take it away from him so quickly he pays everything to pay for the property pays to the next day and he starts a new mission to transfer all of the money to Turkey to Istanbul slowly but surely he moves everything to Istanbul where nobody knows him and uh, he becomes the richest man of the land over there years pass and Arab Tzemach Tzarfati decides that he's going to make Aliyah from Tunis to Eretz Yisrael although the Keila is not happy that their rabbi is leaving they all f- say farewell to him and a few of them go with him they get on the boat they start traveling and at some point they have to stop over in Istanbul Turkey in order to uh get some more food and water for, for the rest of the trip and Arab Tzemach Tzarfati and his uh, few Talmidim get off the ship to go into the market until uh the ship all the people get whatever they need as they get off and they start walking all of a sudden they see a whole entourage surra- surrounding a very rich man and all of a sudden the rich man sees Araf Tzarfati he runs 
moves everybody aside, splitting the ocean, runs to Rav Tzemach Tzadfati and falls on his face, bowing to the rabbi, kissing his feet and his hands. Kvod Arav, Kvod Arav, Kvod Arav, Kvod Arav. The rabbi doesn't know who this guy is. He says, Rabbi, me, you remember me? I'm the baker. I'm the baker. You gave me a blessing. HaKadosh Baruch Hu made it. HaKadosh Baruch Hu made it real. And he tells him the story. He gives the rabbi a very big gift. And he also says, you take this also for your Talmidim and Yerushalayim. And I'm going to send you money every month. And Rav Tzarfati says to him, as long as you're going to be good to the Jewish people, HaKadosh Baruch Hu continue blessing you. And that's what he did. Every month he would send money to Talmidei Chachamim. And not only did HaKadosh Baruch Hu continue blessing him, he became even more rich and more successful. And the blessing of the Rav of Talmid Chacham came. Why? First and foremost, if you're going to do what HaKadosh Baruch Hu said, that's already a good thing. You're tzaddik, it's already a good thing. But if you're going to do this above and beyond for the sake of Torah, the blessing that a person can make. Does above and beyond only apply to a Jew? No, it also applies to a non-Jew. Does it have to be above and beyond like you have to lift a mountain over your head? Not necessarily. Look at the example of this story, a real story. All he did is wake up four times, lift something that was extremely heavy in order for the rabbi to learn more Torah. It's not exactly such a big deal. The question is, at the moment of truth, where Hashem sends you that opportunity, would you have done the same thing? That's the question. Some people say, yeah, of course I would do it. Just give me the same thing. But who says Hashem is going to give you the same exact test? Hashem gives everybody a test in, in their own level, in their own time. Make sure you know. If you start working on yourself now to be not just a tzaddik, but to be a chassid in every way that you can, to do above and beyond in every way that you can, of course do everything you need to do. But if you can do more sometimes, do more sometimes. If all you can do is what you need to do, then do that, of course. But the point being is, anytime you have an opportunity to do more, do more. And Be'ezat Hashem HaKadosh Baruch Hu bless each and every single one of you, no matter where you are in the world, and no matter what your life started as, but rather where you're taking it. With that being said, let's start taking some questions. Be'ezat Hashem, after I get a little drink. Okay, question number one is coming. Lea Levitan. She usually has the most difficult questions. I see the question just disappeared. I'm sorry, Lea, you have to send the question again. It was something about birth, but I didn't get the chance to read the whole question. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, Yitzchak. Uh, I assume Adam Alishon will be resurrected with the dead because his body is intact. Uh, will he be Jewish? Which neshama will he have? Uh, being that he was originally contained everyone's neshamot. Uh, this is more of a uh, world of uh, Kabbalah. I mean, Adam Alishon uh, also got reincarnated as Yaakov Avinu. So uh, Yaakov Avinu had to complete the tikkun of, uh, of Adam Alishon. Uh, but as far as the different neshamot, who, what, when, and how, that's too deep, too extensive for uh, uh, for this type of shield. Uh, Moshe is asking, um, I read in Masechet Brachot the type of mazal for, for neshama that comes down for a newborn depends on when, where he's born. When a convert converts, a new neshama comes down. Is the mazal of the convert, the new neshama, on their day of conversion, also influenced by the location of where they convert? Uh, as far as the location, not so much, but rather be, uh, as far as uh, you know, if they convert the right way and what their uh, actions are uh, that preceded it and what their actions are going to be after. But uh, one thing I can tell you is that uh, if a person is a legitimate convert, a very serious convert, uh, part of their mazal is, is, is initially is based on how difficult it was for them to convert. And this I'm telling you from experience and also something that I've seen from, from the sages. Where you see, um, if a person has a very easy time converting, then uh, they tend to have more difficulties at first in their life. Whereas if a person had a lot of difficulty conversion, 
uh, converting and they end up overcoming it, then they have a lot of miracles and an easier time in life after conversion. That's just simply something I've seen uh, from experience and also I've read it somewhere. I don't remember where though. Uh, the second thing is also is that conversion is a, uh, is a process, meaning unlike a, uh, or similar to a newborn, where you see the newborn is, is born and they, they have a certain type of mazal and, and, and certain things, but that newborn also develops over time. You know, he grows, she grows, and they, uh, the same concept is with the convert. The convert, the change of a convert is not just initially where they get the neshama, and that's it. The, the the convert also changes otherwise, so much so that the, uh, I believe it was the Khatam Sofer, said that the convert changes physically. Physically, the convert changes. Uh, now, I've seen from experience with dealing with converts, some really serious and, and righteous converts, I've seen converts change physically. Uh, the, and I'm not talking about because they changed their clothes or because they're, uh, they got older. I'm talking about a convert changing physically where, you know, one day a convert for 30, 40 years of their life, they had a phobia. Anybody that understands phobias knows that phobias is not being scared. Phobia is a, it's, it's beyond, it's, it's, it's something that a person doesn't have control over. Before they converted, they had 30, 40 years of a phobia of certain things. After they converted, they no longer had that phobia. Uh, I've, I've, I've seen a certain uh, convert before they converted had issues physically after converted no issues physically uh, and all types of things like this so the conversion is similar to a newborn in a sense that there is a uh, other developments after the conversion and not just uh, the initial uh, but as far as how much changes there are going to be how many miracles there are going to be how much difficulty is going to be all that other stuff depends on how the, uh, the, the convert lives their life, uh, in so many words. Uh, next question is, uh, it's uh, somebody saying, unfortunately, missionaries are everywhere. Uh, yeah, you're right, 100%. Uh, oh, my dear friend, uh, Shannon Nuzin. Uh, see, thank you very much for watching the show with us. Uh, this should be reporting your community uh, directly to the municipal. Okay, so I guess you're talking to one of the uh, people talking about uh, missionaries. Yeah. Uh, one thing I've mentioned in regards to missionaries um, and, and working in, uh, and, and trying to do whatever I can to wake people up, uh, I believe that. Uh, one thing I've seen myself and also one thing I've seen from, uh, from uh, working with, with, with this world, working with, with Shannon and, and, and just seeing what's happening out there is that we as a Jewish community, as Jewish people, especially the religious ones, are our own worst enemy in every aspect, which includes with the way we deal with missionaries. Meaning that people are so clueless about the danger of missionaries that for whatever reason or another, they just simply disregard it. Like they'll find out that there is a Christian missionary in their community. And many times people won't care. Like, no, he won't affect my kids. My kids are religious. My kids are going to yeshiva. My kids are not going to be uh, impacted by that junk. And by the time they realize that it, that's not necessarily true, it's too late. So much so that you have literally some of the greatest promoters of missionaries are Orthodox Jews. The, you see women with kisui rosh, women with wigs, men with beards and hats, rabbis actually working hand in hand with Christian missionary organizations, doing all types of things, and in essence, opening the door to the Jewish communities to missionaries that are literally uh, programmed to destroy the Jewish people. And for whatever reason or another, people don't understand that this is a risk. And uh, that's why there's going to be a lot of horrible things that uh, happen in certain communities. But those horrible things will be reported after it's already too late. There's something that's going to be coming out in the coming days of something that's been happening already for a while in a certain community. Of Bezal Hashem is going to be exposed. I've told you about these guys. Uh, without sh sharing the names, but just pay attention to the news, pay attention to our pages, pay attention to what's going on. You'll see literally one of the worst situations 
um, in recent history of what's been happening in a Jewish community or multiple Jewish communities which involves rabbis, multiple rabbis, uh, multiple people that have made the mistake, international issues, and literally to a point where the missionaries are not only inside a Jewish community, but they are functioning as rabbis, they're Christian missionaries that believe in Jesus, that believe that uh, their goal in life is to convert Jews to Jesus and all types of other idolatry. And these missionaries are functioning inside a Jewish community as rabbis that look more religious than you and I, as people that are Sofer Stam, they're writing a uh, Torah scroll, they're writing Mezuzot, they're writing a get for people they're in a bed din. they're converting people this is happening as we speak this is happening as we speak and the main main reason is because we are not careful enough to realize how dangerous the missionaries are so there's going to be a lot of fireworks after this thing comes out because people don't realize the ramifications and when the ramifications come out, you're going to see that there are certain people in your Jewish community that you've had for Shabbat dinner, that you have uh, considered even marrying, and you'll find out that those people are not Jewish. Why? They, are, they converted with a Christian, a person that's not even Jewish. We're not talking about it's a Jew that became a Christian, and but thereby he's still technically halakhically Jewish. No, we're talking about this person is a Gentile, believes in idolatry, and still does, but pretends to be Jewish, and he's on a Jewish beddin converting people. And he's doing weddings, and he's doing Brit Milah, and he's writing Sifre Torah. 100% idol worshiper. This is what we have. Multiple situations like this, and more coming. And... Part of the reason, a big part of the reason is because the religious Jewish world is simply careless about the Christian danger, so much so that they're actually helping them. And in some cases, I've seen with my own eyes, religious Jewish people calling the Christian organizations that are known to be missionaries, the best friends of the Jews. Now, when a secular idiot like Bibi Netanyahu calls the Christian uh, church the, uh, the, uh, 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 the best friends of the Jews, I don't really take that to heart. He's clueless. I would be surprised if he himself is not a Christian. So there's nothing here that, that surprises me. He's secular. He's, he's completely clueless. But when religious Jews are not only working together with the Christians, but they're actually promoting them, they're helping them, they're giving them the stage they're helping them raise money and all types of stuff it's it baffles me why because you see the damage i mean i have people send me all the time just a week ago a woman cries to me tells me listen you need to help my daughter well what happened oh she just uh, married a uh, christian guy uh okay well how long has she been dating him oh four years now you come to me after she married him it's too late nothing i can do about it now you should have come four years ago but that's the thing. No, I didn't think it was going to be serious because she got a this and she... Rabotai, the Christian danger is, is more dangerous than it ever was before. Back then they used to try to kill our bodies. Now they're trying to outright kill our souls and we don't even realize it. Because sometimes they're coming to us looking like a religious Jew and sometimes they're being helped by our actual religious Jew. So there's going to be a lot of fireworks coming very soon and uh, it's unfortunate. Honestly, this is not the type of fireworks I want. This is a nightmare, but uh, there's going to be a lot of situations where you'll see certain people uh, were thought to be Jewish. They had kids and they thought they were Jewish and they're not Jewish. A divorce was not a divorce, which means that if that person had kids, those kids are mamzerim because she was still married to her ex-husband and so on and so forth. The ramifications are horrendous, horrendous. But if we're not going to take... Uh, the Torah, seriously, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is going to give us measure for measure. Shem Yishmo. Um, Noach being the original conspiracy theorist. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I guess you could say that. I guess you could say that. Uh, Ricardo said, I make Melvin Malaka right after Abdullah. Do I make a main shalosh 
on the cup of wine first, or can I rely on Berkat Hamazon for Atavacha? No, you should do main shalosh on the uh, on uh, uh, after Abdullah. You drink the wine and you do the blessing on the wine, and then after that you do uh, the melavel uh, uh, Separate blessing, separate time, because you don't know how long it's going to be. No, you uh, make it a uh, separate things. Also, it's another opportunity to do a mitzvah. More, you know, another blessing is another mitzvah. How can a person stop overeating? Um, I, this is all has to do with a uh, controlling your nature, controlling your uh, things. I mean, it's uh, not easy. It's just like smoking or any other type of desire. A person needs to have enough, uh, enough reason not to do it. Uh, enough reason not to do it. The Masechet uh, Avot says, Marbe Basar Marbe Rima that a person that eats a lot of meat will uh, have a lot of worms eat him one day. Why? Because the more he eats, 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 the more fat he's going to be. more fat is going to be. Eventually, the maggots have to eat him after he dies. So when a person watches the movie Chibuta Kever that we made and starts thinking about uh, these things and realizes that he doesn't want to have the uh, extra pain that he's bringing on himself both during his life of living as a heavy person and uh, after. So uh, that, that in itself is one motivation for some people. Uh, another thing has to do with the person's schedule. If he has a uh, schedule that's very long, if he doesn't sleep very much, that's uh, also a problem. Why? Because when you don't sleep very much and you have, uh, you're have up late hours, uh, you tend to eat, tend to eat. And, uh, and even sometimes even if you don't eat, you, uh, you end up uh, still uh, not being able to uh, digest properly and so on. So a person has to give himself a motivation uh, to stop whatever he's doing wrong by, number one, uh, identifying the fact that it's wrong and, uh, and evaluating the consequences, like taking a piece of paper and writing the different things that he knows are going to happen to him at one point or another or are likely to happen to him or her if they continue this way, uh, health issues, this issue, that issue, but also eternity issues. That's one. Second thing is, uh, is to look at the reward of, uh, of overcoming it, of overcoming it. One of the greatest re- rewards that a person can get uh, from overcoming an obstacle is the fact that they now know that they can overcome an obstacle. And that in itself gives you the strength to overcome other obstacles and become a domino effect. Uh, but there are certain things that, uh, you know, are very difficult for people. So everybody has to evaluate where they're at and do the best they can. Do the best they can and, uh, and, and Hashem will succeed. And also pray to Hashem for success. But don't give up just because it's hard. Uh, Neshama Guter is asking in Parashat Noach, it mentions, uh, God remembers Noach and all of the beasts and all of the animals that were with him in the ark. Uh, and God caused the spirit to pass over. Okay, is this the same spirit that hovered over the uh, water in Parashat Berashit? If so, is there a connection between the two? One is on the water and one is on the earth, uh, part of the elements. I'm not really understanding the point of the question, to be honest with you. Is it the same? I mean, yeah, it's God. Uh, it's God is uh, shows his presence in different ways, hence the reason of why Hashem has uh, different names. The two most popular names are Elohim and uh, Yud Ke Vav Ke, uh, but uh, there are other names that uh, the Kabbalists use, and each name is, in essence, a uh, different way that Hashem uh, shows Himself to us. The same thing with the Shekhinah. It's a different way that Hashem shows Himself. It's not pieces of God, Chas Shalom. Hashem is one, and, and, uh, and, and there is only one Hashem. Uh, and uh, So there's not, no parts of Hashem. But there's just simply different ways that Hashem presents Himself, uh, as far as uh, you know. Uh, give you an example in a uh, um, uh, the Rambam writes in uh, Shmona Prakim uh, that I think it's chapter seven, uh, where he says that the, uh, the the prophet of all prophets is Moshe Rabbeinu. But uh, of course, the other prophets were great too. The, the greatest other prophet after Moshe Rabbeinu was the prophet uh, Isaiah. But he says that while all of the other prophets, uh, when they spoke to Hashem, they, uh, they weren't standing. They had to sleep. It was through an epilepsy. It was through a dream. It was different ways. 
Um, but still, even that uh, was not just the main difference. The other difference is the fact that their prophecy that they got from Hashem was through parables. Uh, it wasn't clear. And in essence, the, uh, uh, the, the message that Hashem gave each prophet was as if someone is talking to you uh, from behind a uh, glass or from behind a wall or behind a thicker wall and so on and so forth. So he says, while all the other prophets, uh, each in his own level, spoke to Hashem as if he's talking to them uh, uh, behind the wall, so you're hearing, let's say, an echo, or you're hearing it in a faint way or something like that. When uh, he spoke to Moshe, uh, first and foremost, he didn't speak to him in parables. He spoke to him clearly, like one man speaks to his friend, and he spoke to him with such clarity that uh, it was uh, as if he was standing right next to him. As if he was standing right next to him. So, in essence, the way Hashem presents himself, not just to the prophets, but to all of creation, is in different ways. Is in different ways, depending on the perspective of the person, uh, depending on the uh, the level of the people, uh, and depending on how Hashem wants, what message Hashem wants to give. So, in this particular case, you have Hashem hovering over the world in creation, and you have Hashem hovering uh, over the world in, uh, in essence, uh, a recreation, but a different type of recreation because the first creation was, like as I said in the beginning of Shio, creation from nothing. Whereas here, it's more of innovation uh, of, of, the, uh, of the world, and even lesser than what it was creation, because in creation, Hashem took the pieces that He already created and putting in place, Whereas now, uh, in the time of Noah, Hashem simply after he destroyed the world, he allowed the nature that he already instilled into the world to start uh, functioning again. So uh, I assume it is a different type of, uh, uh, of, of presenting himself, but nonetheless, for all intents and purposes, it's the same God and uh, that that's really what's uh, you know what's what's the most uh, important here. Uh, Jeremy is asking. I, ha- I heard a teaching from uh, the Aliyah Kadosh that Bachurim will serve in the Bet Mikdash Shlishi, but the Rambam says only Kohanim. Uh, any opinions on this? Uh, I mean, as far as the uh, the uh, the Bet Mikdash is going to have. Uh, uh, different people. You have different people. You have the Levim, you have the Kohanim. You know, you know, it's not just uh, Kohanim. There's also Levim that are in the uh, Bet HaMikdash. It's also a person that, you know, the Bet HaMikdash has, a, uh, uh, it's a whole world. It's not just like, a lot of people think the Bet HaMikdash is just a place where you do a uh, uh, sacrifices. But if anyone that reads about the Bet HaMikdash knows that the Bet HaMikdash had different departments you go into one one room you see that there is a bunch of wood there why because they need the constant wood to burn the uh kobanot, the fire then you have another place where you have showers uh, and pools then you have another place where you have a hair cutting a whole barber shop then you have a uh, meat house then you have uh, skinning and there's a whole you know the, the bet mikdash had a lot of different rooms and a lot of different people with different positions uh and it's not just coining it's not just coining uh, so uh, I don't believe the Rambam says that only Kohanim will be in the Bet Uh There are because there are certain functions that a Kohen doesn't do. For example, you don't need a Kohen to slaughter a cow. Uh, this is actually in the Gemara. Uh, one of the Chachamim, uh, 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 I think it was Elia Kohen, uh, was asked uh, whether they should do the sacrifice or not because the Kohen that was typically would slaughter the cow. Um, is not there. And uh, for a moment, the, the Kohen Gadol forgot what the Alecha is, and a little boy named Shmuel, which ends up becoming Shmuel Anavi, he was only two or three years old, says, no, you don't need a Kohen. You don't need a Kohen to slaughter a cow. You need a Kohen to do the sacrifice, but the slaughtering itself is not done by Kohen. It's Israel. Just a regular Israel does the Kohen, does the, uh, sacri- the uh, slaughtering. Uh, so uh, for that, actually almost uh, killed him because you're not allowed to say Allah in front of your rabbi, but because he was only two or three years old, <laughs> he let him go. But the point being is that uh, this is surely known by the Rambam. This is, uh, you know, and uh, 
that and a trillion other things that the Rambam knows that I could never even imagine. So therefore, I, you know, I don't know of any place that the Rambam says that only Kohanim will be in the Bet HaMikdash. Uh, that's not, uh, because it's simply not, just doesn't, never happen and never will. So uh, I'm not really sure where, where you got that from. It's most likely somebody said this to you and, uh, because they don't know and they heard it and it became a game of telephone. Uh, so I was asking, I found a tzaddik on some forum who was expressing feelings so exhausted about prayers during uh, uh, turning robotical. For example, shachid being too long. And to pray with kavanah, it may require several hours a day. Okay, is there a minimum uh, of prayer still considered praying? For example, when praying alone. Um, yeah, I mean, you just do the prayer that it says. Uh, do the prayer that it says. I mean, as far as the, uh, if you're talking about minimum amount of time, I mean, you could simply read it to the best of your ability and uh, you try uh, at the very least to have as much kavanah as possible during the uh, uh, Shema Yisrael uh, section that hold the paragraphs that have to do with Shema Yisrael. Uh, also with Nishmat Kol Chai, Baruch Shamar, uh, and Amida. Amida is like pretty much the whole time that you're reading in the, in the morning is to prepare yourself and elevating different sparks of your Neshama uh, higher and higher and higher to get to a point where you're able to uh, do Amida. That's in essence everything is preparing for Amida. So when you get to Amida, you have to be at your loftiest level. The Gemara says that the Hasidim of, of those generation used to uh, 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 meditate for an hour before they would pray just to uh, just to uh, uh, get themselves to be at the level they needed to be in uh, to pray and then after they finished praying they would uh, have to meditate another hour to lower themselves which means that nine hours a day they would be uh, involved in prayer. So the Gemara says, how do they, if they were praying, if meditating an hour before the prayer, an hour of the prayer, an hour after the prayer, and they're doing this three times a day, when do they have to learn to, time to learn Torah? He said, if you pray like that, HaKadosh Baruch will give you Siyad Bishma and you learn a lot of Torah in less time. The point is, is that a, a lot of times when we uh, are in our, you know, don't pray as good as we should, it's because our mind is elsewhere. It's not because praying is robotic it's rather we see something as more important than praying we see our business more important we see a uh, chores being more important we see other things and more important so a person needs to understand that every time you pray is an opportunity for you to speak to your creator speak to your king if i told you you have an opportunity to uh to speak to i don't know whoever is the best person on earth that you want to talk to you know uh would you want to do it of course, you'd want to do it. You'd prepare for it. You'd probably even fast just to, uh, you know, make sure that you are uh, at uh, tip-top shape, you know, to prepare for this uh, meeting. But yet, we don't uh, look at the meeting that we have with Hashem several times a day as the same thing. And that's a mistake. So a person needs to know. When you're praying to Hashem, you have to try to do the best you can each time as if it's brand new. As if it's brand new. So even though HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells us, Make uh, you know we pray to Hashem to make his Torah and his learning uh, something that we're used to. At the same token, we're commanded in the uh, uh, by by the sages to make the Torah and everything as if it's new every day. So when when a person looks at prayer as an opportunity to meet his Creator, the only one that can give him whatever he wants, the only one that is uh, is there for him regardless of what's going on. Uh, in so many words. All the things that were that are distracting us are things that our king can solve for us. So when a person looks at prayer that way, it makes it a little easier to have some more kavanah. And like I said, at the very least, during Amida. During Amida, but usually to have kavanah in Amida, you already have to start preparing with the prayers before it. Now, if you're talking about as far as quantity of prayer, meaning the minimum of minimum prayer. A, per, a Jew has to pray three times a day. Uh, you have the morning prayer, you have the afternoon prayer, Mincha, and you have the uh, 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 um, evening prayer, Mariv, which is usually prayed right after Mincha. But sometimes some people pray 
uh, much later. Either way, you have three times a day. Uh, during uh, Mincha and, 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 and Arvid, there's really no, uh, there's not, no room there because you have a prayer, you have to pray, and it's short anyway. The longest prayer is, is, uh, is, uh, is Shachrit. Uh, and uh, of course, everybody wants to cut the prayer as short as possible. Again, if you are pressed for time, there are certain exceptions you can make uh, to, to cut the prayer, but you should try not to make it a habit. Uh, at the very least, a person should do Baruch Shamal, uh, Ashrei, uh, should they, uh, you know, do all of the uh, Shema Israel, all of the blessings of Shema Israel, Amidah. Uh, you know, these are basic minimums, but, you know, there are other things. I wouldn't say that, you know, you should rely on what I just said, and this is how your prayer is going to be from now on. Uh, everybody knows that if somebody's a brand new Baal Tshuva, you don't uh, press on them to pray the whole uh, prayer, uh, but rather you tell them, listen, just do Shema Yisrael and Amida, and you're good. Sometimes people tell them, just, you know, just do Shema Yisrael, but that's really not enough. But do Shema Yisrael and Amida, and that's good. Now, of course, it is good. It is good. At least they're fulfilling the obligation of saying Shema Yisrael, and they're fulfilling, fulfilling the obligation of Amida. So yes, it's good. And if they're brand new Baal Tshuva, it's fantastic. Because just yesterday, they were you know, a uh, eating pig. So for them to pray today is, is a huge milestone. But if you're already religious for a while and, and, and you're still uh, uh, shortchanging everything, it's not, it's not ideal. It's not ideal. You should uh, uh, try to do better. Try to do better. Uh, again, it's, uh, if, uh, if a person is uh, having a hard time, uh, you know, the question is why? Really, that's, the, that's really the question is, why do you have such a hard time? Is it because... You're uh, learning uh, so much. You're doing so much. Like usually, it's really more more on, on that than anything else. I mean, there are some people that pray much less, but that's also because their schedule is very different. Their life is very different. So you know, it's it's really the bigger bigger thing is why. You know, if it's just because you need to work, it's not it's not usually a sufficient excuse. Uh, Jose is asking, what does the Pasuk and Hashem remembered Noah actually mean? What, why does the Torah use this specific word? Chachamim uh, imply the word Zachol for non Jews. Uh, future Noahides. I'm not sure about the second part of the question. As far as Hashem remembered Noah, Hashem remembered all of the creation. Uh, that's actually in, the, um, in this week's uh, parasha. You look at the verse, I actually looked at it earlier, and uh, it talks about, it. in essence, it's the uh, reviewing the merits. Here you go, here it is. Uh, that um, in uh, chapter 8, verse 1, it says, uh, It's a very long verse, but it's a little bit more. So it says, and uh, God remembered Noah and all of the beasts and all of the animals that were with him in the ark. And God caused the spirit to pass over the earth and the water subsided. So we see here by Yiskol that Kadosh Baruch Hu, in essence is reviewing, reviewing the merits of Noah. And it says, et Noah. Et Noah means that it's, it's more than just Noah. Noah and his merits, Noah and his family, Noah and the, all the things that are living. Noah and also things that are living, and but also the one the animals, everything that has to do with the tzaddik, everything that has to do with the tzaddik, uh, he's reviewing it, and then after evaluating everything, Hashem decided to make a uh, make uh, the a decree, make the decree to to have the uh, the water subside, meaning that it's not enough to think, oh, if he's a tzaddik then uh, he'll have a great benefit from it. No, what a person needs to understand is that uh, the way that HaKadosh Baruch Hu judges the world is that he judges not just the person, but every the world around that person. So much so, I remember years ago that uh, I learned this from Rabbi Fahim, that uh, before HaKadosh Baruch Hu takes a person from the world, he doesn't just simply judge that person, but he rather he judges all of the things, all of the people are, that are connected to that person, meaning that he brings all of the things that are written in the, in the book of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, all the things that HaKadosh Baruch Hu remembers, which is everything, 
he brings it up in front of him, all of the merits, all of the uh, issues that have to do with everybody involved, everybody that will benefit out of it, everybody will get hurt out of it. And if uh, Kadosh Baruch sees, okay, so this person, his time has come, or he did something and he deserves a death penalty, but he's connected to his family. His family, they're, uh, you know, maybe decent, but they did enough, enough things that they also deserve the suffering. Okay, so, so far, check, the guy's going to die. Then he has to say, okay, but yeah, but he doesn't have just family. He also has a, uh, uh, you know, aside from siblings, he also has wife and kids. So he checks the wife and kids. He sees who, what, what they are. Then after that, he sees the wife and kids have uh, family. And then there's a employees, then there is the boss, then there's this. And so much so that if there is a tzaddik that that person is connected to, and even if he hasn't seen that tzaddik in 20 years, but that tzaddik, when he would hear that this person died, he would really get hurt from it, he would, he would, he would suffer from it, he would uh, cry over it, and that tzaddik does not deserve to cry, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will give that person more life just because of that tzaddik. Which means that the, the, uh, the connection to a tzaddik is so great, so great, so beneficial to the world around them that here HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, look, I'm not only reviewing the uh, Noah, I'm reviewing everything that's around them and everything is in essence connected. That's one of the reasons. I'm sure if we delve further into the Psukim, whether you go into Midrash Rabbah or you go into uh, uh, the Ramban or Chaim and, and many others, there are many, many other tidbits that you can get and teachings that you can get from why Kadosh Baruch Hu says he remembered Noah, but this is one thing that uh, I saw today. Um, also, are the remnants of the Teva found in Turkey legitimate? Uh, is that the correct hal uh, To my knowledge, uh, it seems legitimate. There is a mountain called Ararat. It's still named the same Ararat, and according to the people that have looked into it, it's the same exact location. Uh, that's one. Uh, it, it is in Turkey. Uh, second thing is is that uh, multiple people checked not just the original uh, missionary that went on a uh, mission to uh, to prove Noah, but also others have checked and uh, brought some type of evidence. Again, today the world is very different than it was uh, during uh, these discoveries. Uh, but the biggest thing, to be honest with you, is the fact that uh, uh, it's a um, it's it's not something that the government wants. Meaning that it's not easy to get to this place. It's not easy to. Uh, um, uh, they're not necessarily opening up this place for tourism, let's just say that. So I think that it looks legitimate. I can't uh, uh, vouch for it, but everything that I've seen, which has been years already since I've looked into it, it seems uh, very much legitimate that it is the remains of the, uh, of the Teva in Mount, at the top of Mount Ararat. Uh, just like the, uh, the Pasuk says, Pasuk says in this week's parasha. Uh, chapter uh, 8, uh, verse number uh, 4, talks about how it's in uh, uh, at the top of uh, mountain Ararat. So, um, it, I think I think there's, you know, I don't think there's really a reason to doubt it. The measurements make sense. There's people that went inside, so it's wood. Uh, I mean, again, can they make it up? Of course they can make it up, but, uh, you know, I, I don't see the benefit out of it. Um, interestingly, there is a couple of places in the world where they made a, uh, a display of, uh, the, uh, the Ark. I think that there's one in America that some Christian organization, uh, made, uh, they believe is an exact replica of the uh, Tevat Noach. Uh, I, uh, saw some things on the, uh, some video of, uh, of it. It looks amazing, but unfortunately, it's controlled by the uh, Christian uh, ideology, uh, which obviously is problematic, uh, to say the least. But nonetheless, there are, there are a couple of places in the world where they have uh, different displays and different things that uh, a person can see. But um, for all of you uh, Jews, do not go on a Christian uh, uh, tour guide 
just for the sake of seeing these uh, uh, beautiful sights. If you can go without being bothered by them, that's one thing. But, uh, you know, don't go there and uh, thinking that uh, it's not going to affect your neshama. Either way, to be honest with you, a lot, a lot of the stuff that's, uh, that's uh, out there today, you know, it's, it's not biblically accurate. So many times people teach you one thing and, and, and it's really not. So, I mean, there's even, there's even uh, things in books. I mean, just actually the other day, I uh, saw we got a, you know, a little book. I was reading to my kids and I saw it was about the book, the... Uh, uh, the prophet Yonah, prophet Yonah, and I got this, we got this, somebody sent us this book, somebody got this book, and uh, my kids wanted to read about Yonah, so I read them the book of Yonah, uh, and uh, I'm reading this kid's book, and I see the book has a mistake, the book has a mistake, it says that uh, Yonah jumped into the water, Yonah didn't jump into the water, he got, he got, you know, thrown into the water, but whatever, he has some mistakes, and uh, again, for the kids, for the purpose of the kids, it doesn't really make much of a difference as far as the story is concerned. But you know, I like to be accurate. And I looked up the uh, I looked up the author, and I find out that some secular woman wrote this book. You know, so uh, it's many times if it's if books are uh, or whatever you're going to is 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 made by people that are not committed to the authenticity of the Torah, uh, you're you're bound to fall into a trap of some kind. Uh, you're bound to fall into a trap of some kind and uh, Hashem only knows how many traps are in the educational system of the uh, of uh, you know the world uh, it's, I mean, it's, there's so much stuff that's hidden from from uh, from the educational system that people don't realize that if they send their kids to anything that's not authentic Torah teaching simply it's like sending their kids to a spiritual Holocaust uh, because simply what they teach kids today in history classes and science classes uh, and, and all these types of classes is just outright lies. Lies in history, lies in the sciences, lies in uh, uh, everything. I mean, most people think that the, uh, the biggest form of racism that was exerted uh, in the last hundred years was uh, in uh, Nazi Germany. Uh, maybe, uh, uh, maybe so to a certain extent as far as uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the amount of murders that they committed, but as far as the, the beliefs and the, and, and the teachings, those very same teachings were in America at the same time and even before. Some of the, uh, some of the people that Adolf Hitler looked up to were Americans. Were Americans, some of them were, uh, were, were uh, people from uh, different parts of Europe that uh, had the very same mindset. In fact, there was a... Uh, uh, a certain pattern uh, that uh, had World War II not happened, it was very likely that America would have become Nazi Germany. I mean, America had uh, racism against blacks, against Jews, against everybody that wasn't white, uh, that was identical to Adolf Hitler. Uh, they even had a, uh, a zoo of people. Literally, they had a, peep, they had a, they had a zoo a zoo in in, in 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 St. Louis, a zoo in uh, in the Bronx Zoo where they had people, they had black people in the cage. They had uh, all types of uh, people in cages because they weren't white and uh, they viewed them as less than uh, less than human. And uh, all of the high society white people would attend and look at these people and like you know and, and make fun of them and, and look at them as animals. And if you didn't believe in the Darwinian theories of evolution, you were uh, mocked and, and laughed at because that was the truth to them. And these were the leading sciences, leading universities, Harvard, Yale, all of the uh, uh, biggest, most famous uh, American institutions uh, were just as racist, just as, uh, 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 you know, disgusting as Adolf Hitler. They just never got a chance to kill six million people or six million Jews and countless other millions. So the educational system doesn't teach you that. Educational system in Eretz Yisrael teaches you that Herzl and, and, and Ben Gurion and, uh, and, 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 and Shamir and all these other people were heroes. In reality, they were murderers. 
There were murderers of Jews. There were murderers of, of, of literally at least a million Jews. At least a million Jews, if not more. These people that are celebrated in all types of Zionism classes are actual murderers. Uh, but they don't teach you that in, in school. Uh, they don't teach you that in history. So unless a person self-studies, they're never going to know it. You're never going to know that there was literally zoos of animals in America. People think that racism was only in other countries and the racism in America was like, you know, with black people maybe, I don't know, like 400 years ago. It's complete nonsense. You know, it's a, uh, there's racism in America, it's racism in, in other countries was atrocious in, in, in some cases, still atrocious, but nowhere near what it was. But it all came from some form of uh, atheism or an, uh, uh, something that was a uh, uh, antithetical to the Torah. Anytime people preached things that were against the Torah, tragedy followed. So, uh, you know, when, when, a, when a person is, a, uh, is, uh, is in the world that is full of lies and he doesn't take control of the information that gonna, he's going to allow in and out into his, his life or into his kid's life, he's, he's simply uh, uh, setting himself up for failure and to, our, uh, to, to a life of, uh, of misinformation. David is asking, what's the Torah's opinion on Flavius Josephus, uh, his writings, what he said, Josephus was a liar, uh, he distorted history for the sake of uh, his own agenda, just like journalists do today. Uh, did Shem and Evel study Torah under Noah? Uh, yeah, I mean, Shem was his son, uh, so yeah, I mean, they were with him for many, many years. Um, about women, try to teach men. Uh, women are not allowed to teach men. No, men are not allowed to learn from women. Uh, if women gives birth during Shabbat, oh, here we go. Leah Levitan came back. Uh, if woman uh, gives uh, birth on Shabbat and has to go to a hospital, it's preferable that during Shabbat she eats food and doesn't require preparation such as protein bar, fruit, or should she eat hospital food that is heated probably by a non-Jew because she's considered pikoch nefesh and she's eating only for nutrition and not uh, because food is good. Uh, it's actually quite gross. Uh, no, when, when, a, when a woman is in a pikoch nefesh uh, situation, she, you're allowed to, uh, it's a mitzvah to warm food for her. Uh, so she should not, uh, uh, she should not uh, uh, be too particular as far as uh, uh this one you know during this time she goes to the hospital she'll eat whatever is best for her if that means it's hospital food that's kosher eat hospital food if that means food from the house uh, be who's from the house whatever it is best for her don't eat protein bars at this stage of your life when you're giving birth and your your body is very uh, uh um uh fragile let's just say uh, this is not the time to, to be a uh, chassid. Uh, is, in fact, there's a verse in Alti uh, Tzadik uh, don't be overly righteous. This, this is not, during pregnancy, during uh, uh, times of, uh, of, of life danger, that's not the time to be overly righteous. Eat whatever is best for you, do whatever is best for you uh, without thinking twice of who cooked it, what cooked it. Uh, and so much so that if a person is in life danger and they need to eat and what you have available is pig, it's a mitzvah to make pig and let them eat the pig. Do you understand? So you, you don't play with fire. You don't start worrying about what type of kashrut uh, and, and, and who and what. This is not the time. When things calm down, she's perfectly fine and so on. Okay, then you could uh, be picky and so on. But during this time, it's not a time to be picky. It's not a time to be picky. It's not a time to even think about stuff like that. It's not a time to be think about that stuff. There's a uh, teaching Masechet Shabbat. There's a uh, Shem Yishmo, that uh, three uh, reasons uh, you know women die at birth, giving giving uh, giving uh, uh, giving birth, uh, meaning that there is a uh, Gemara asks. I think it's in uh, Masechet Shabbat. Uh, it's Gemara asks why why they're in the time of giving birth. Why not other times? She says, oh, because when any time a woman is giving birth, it's already life danger. She's already vulnerable to life danger. So this, even if a person is young and healthy and everything, 
don't play with fire don't play with fire I've seen people recently perfectly healthy and everything they uh, you know they took some medicine or they did something and all of a sudden they went from being uh, perfectly healthy to uh, you know sickly person that's bleeding from all types of orifices in their in their body so not the time to be overly righteous okay when you're giving birth give birth eat whatever you have to eat be healthy be uh, happy if you ice cream makes you happy eat ice cream we try to eat ice cream whatever it is don't uh, don't be particular about these things not during that time not during that time guys uh, there's a uh, teaching one of the uh, tzaddikim at the time of Bet Mikdash he's blamed he's blamed for destroying the Bet Mikdash because he was overly righteous he was overly righteous don't, don't be overly righteous uh Dwar is asking thank you very much for this you oh, thank you very much for watching uh when I said I was asking for people just uh in the priestly question uh not talking about the view of others what when I said this I was asking for people just in the priestly position of the clan I'm, I'm sorry I understood the first question I don't understand the second question I don't know what you mean I don't know what you mean I'm sorry I'm uh, not uh um, uh, let's see. Okay, I think uh, I answered all the questions today, bro. Yeah, I think we answered all the questions today. I think we answered all the questions today. Oh, whatever the ones that I got. Uh, okay, guys. I have another shiur coming up in a little while in Hebrew. So, uh, oh, it's already two hours anyway. Tizkuli mitzvot rabot. Kadosh b'chu yivayach otchem b'kol mikol kol. Chaim arukim shlemim edayim Torah mitzvot. Gminut chasadim nachat. Please share these lectures. Uh, try to get as many people as possible to uh, to, to watch them. Uh, try to encourage your friends to watch the lectures try to encourage people that you know to donate donate their time donate their skills um, and uh, Bezat Hashem will continue uh, growing will continue doing good things and uh, anybody that has a specific talent uh, whether it be technology or, or, or something that you, they think they could be useful for the sake of helping uh, people doing tshuva and uh, they they want to help us please volunteer and uh, we need as many volunteers as possible to reach as many people as possible so uh, if your talent is making a lot of money and you want to donate that's a great talent if your talent is doing graphics that's a great talent if your talent is uh, computer programming that's a great talent I know one guy he literally has a special villa in Gan Eden, already you already reserved for himself that villa is bigger than this world, uh, just because of his uh, uh, with Nefesh. He uh, built uh, not only uh, our app, he built from Mizrahi's app. He has uh, Hashem, two of the uh, uh, I would say the strongest speakers in, in English language today uh, that uh, that he helped, and this is uh, you know not not. Uh, a merit that's given to just anybody a lot of sacrifices a lot of time a lot of you know and this person when I met him teenager that nobody ever heard of and uh, even the guy that he was supposed to work with that was on our team told me not to not to work with him and Baruch Hashem I don't usually listen to people I listen to Hashem I listen to my you know to to what uh, my intuition uh, says and uh, uh, not only developed a fantastic relationship with this person, but he became one of the key people on our team. And this person is, in, you know, was able to make a app that's the best app in the Torah world today. Uh, uh, that's uh, not only for our organization, for myself, for Rabbi Frying, for Rav Chaim, for for the entire team of Bezal Hashem, but also for Rabbi Mizrahi. And so that's all under the same umbrella. And that's a person that simply had a talent that we, you know. Uh, worked with and helped and so on so a person doesn't understand how much how much he could uh, earn for himself earn for herself 
as a result of contribution. Now, I know some of you send me emails, say, I want to be part of the team, I want to be part of the team, and you don't get a response. The reason why you don't get a response is, number one, because I'm very, very busy, uh, and I have literally very little time to even sleep. And number two, uh, you need to, to bring something to the table, like what, okay, you want to be part of the team and do what? Now, if you're looking for a job to make money and things like that, you know, it's, it's a uh, try elsewhere simply because we're not necessarily just hiring just for the sake of hiring. You know, most of the people that work with us are volunteers. But either way, if somebody has something unique to bring to the table and you think that it's a, uh, uh, something that we can use, then contact us and uh, let us know and we'll decide. We'll decide with the Either way, Rabotai, Bhava Slacha, and we will see each other uh, very soon. Bauch Adonai Leolam, Amen ve Amen. הרב ירון ראובן, הרב אפרים כחלון, ראשי ארגון בעזרת השם, שערכו בפעליון, שעלו מעלה מעלה, יהיה להם ברכה והצלחה, הקדוש ברוך הוא ימלא בלשונות ליבם, לטובה ולברכה, שבכל אשר יפנו, ישכילו ויצליחו, יזכו עוד לעשות כאלה וכאלה, הודיעו תורה לאדירה, אמן ואמן. אמן. הוא היהודי הזה, הוא היה מיליונר, סגר את כל הביזנס, אמר אני משקיע פה בעולמה של תורה. איפה הוא גר? בפלורידה. פלורידה? איפה זה פלורידה? באמריקה. במיאמי. כן, ליד. אנחנו שם עכשיו הולכים להקים קהילה ספרדית. חזק אותו בשביל. קהילה ספרדית גדולה. תעביר לו מה שבירכתי אותו. כן. קהילה ספרדית גדולה. כן.